Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like Simons, we are back again with a really interesting episode about boating, in particular, boating mistakes. These are the mistakes that I think everyone's probably gone through at one phase or another. And we wanted to bring Will. Will used to work with us many moons ago. And now Will's full-time job is going out with mostly new boaters or people who have upgraded their boat from a very small skiff or dinghy to like a legit big boat with multiple engines. And they're just like very overwhelmed. And he gets on the boat for four, sometimes even eight hours, uh, but normally around four hours and, and literally just shows you everything you could possibly want to know. And so we've been talking to Will about it and he's like, man, I'm seeing these mis same mistakes over and over and over again with new boaters, both before the purchase and after the purchase. So there's something to be learned here from everyone, regardless if you're looking to buy a boat, if you just bought a boat, or if you've had a boat for 10 years and you're looking to even upgrade, uh, this is going to be a very, very rich episode. So first and foremost, welcome to the show, Mr. Will Mason. Thank you, guys. Good to be out here. Appreciate and so, you. And so you're called the captain's coach. Uh, and yep. you're, a, you're a captain yourself. And uh, like, how did this whole thing come about? Was it COVID, you saw these new uh, new boat owners and said, hey, I want to go help out. What What's the story? Well, you know, just started the started the company um, just based on the vision of, you know, helping these people that are that are struggling out there. Um, you know, I'm a passionate boater. I've been doing it my whole life. And, uh, you know, obviously we have a ton of new boaters out uh, today around the state of Florida. And uh, really, it's just to, to get out there and, and make sure they know that they can be confident. They can operate their boat at a high level. Very good. And yeah. we got Luke here as, uh, as well, who's uh, owned multiple boats and probably going to be smiling through a lot of this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just just looking at the ramp, right? I mean, you, there's just a lot of mistakes and a lot of it is very easily overcome just with a little bit of guidance. And so I think for any right. new boater, we're going to talk about some of the, the key things. Will has a huge list as uh, yeah. he uses every day and just going to the boat ramp. I just see it every day. Just like a lot of small things that that seem to just continually happen and it just requires just a little bit of guidance and help. And so that's what it's going to be for. Yeah. Trailering, man. It's, it's huge. It's, it's either going to make or break your day. You know, you start there and in there. Yeah. Um, that's part of our four hour training classes. That's, that's the time frame that we do them is four hours. And most of the time people are doing that, or we're going to people's um, lifts behind their houses or their marinas. So we go through that as well. But yeah, it's uh, trailering. It's 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 the spouse, right? It's you and your spouse working together. The communication, uh, I call it the in and out method, right? So I teach the in and out method. We got one person operating the boat, and we got one person doing the truck. The boat never touches the dock unless we're putting the driver of the truck on the dock. It's a simple splash and put back on the trailer. Uh, that's that's kind of how we start. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely tough there. So let's, uh, before we go into that, let's, let's go pre-purchase first. Yeah. Let, let's just start there and kind of separate this podcast and, and we'll spend the majority of time on the after purchase, but what are some of the bigger issues that you're seeing on pre-purchase? What are people overlooking or are they going way too big, way too fast? And yeah, what, what are you seeing? Well, I get asked that question a lot, actually. Um, you know, did I buy too big of a boat? And you know, as a first time boat owner, you probably shouldn't go straight to 50, you know, <laughs> but a lot of these people are buying, you know, 38, 40, 45 foot boats that are a half million dollars. And they just said they just want to go for it. They want to get the one boat that they like and that's it. And that's perfectly fine. But they, they took the right steps and they hired somebody that knows what they're doing to walk them through it. I've got a situation with a guy like that. He's we've done probably 20 classes together and um he's taken the initiative to do that. And we've built him from the ground up. And also just before you even start thinking about buying a boat, getting into the Coast Guard safety course, uh, you know, those online videos, those online tests, the Florida Boater Safety Course, just getting a basic fundamental understanding of navigating and, and what to do out there. Yeah. I mean, it, it could literally save your life. I mean, there, we, yeah. And, and we see it right in our Facebook group and even our community all the time or like scratch your head, like, did this person like literally ever <laughs> see any rule at all? Uh, and, and a lot of people haven't, which is, you know, we're laughing, but it's kind of sad. I think that's super, super important. What else? Um, what else are you seeing on the pre-purchase side before we get into the, now I own a boat, what the heck do I do? 
Well, I think what's what I've seen that's very frustrating is I wish people actually consulted with somebody other than just the salesperson that they're working with to make sure that the boat fits them. Um, there's not too much fluff on the boat and what they need is actually there and they don't go too much or too little. Uh, that's a huge mistake I see. And like, and like, give me an example. Like not buying the right electronics or uh, maybe this particular windless setup is not the greatest or, um, you know, something that's frustrating about the boat that they'll, they'll find out later on, you know what I mean? When you're out on it. So that's, that's really, um, I've kind of learned that and, you know, clients have really accepted that feedback too. What, what about on the trailers? Are most people getting the right trailer at least with new and or used boats? Or are you seeing some people like, man, I can't believe they told you to get this trailer. Yeah. Most of the time the trailers fit with the boat on okay. the, for the package for newer boats that are trailered. Um, Sometimes you'll see that every once in a while, like with a guy that buys a 36 yellow fin or something, he'll get the wrong trailer or something. But most of the time it's, it's packaged up. Okay. All right. Now with your clients in particular, are you seeing mostly brand new boats or are you seeing them buying used boats or is it a combination? I'd say 70% of the business we see right now are newer boaters. Uh, but a lot of the boaters that uh, we've been working with are people that they either just upgraded and they've been boaters like if they go from a twin outboard to a triple outboard or something like that, or they just found our videos, they found our information and said, wow, this is really cool. I want to learn as much knowledge as possible, right? Which is kind of like the insider club and, and fishing, you know, just gain every little thing that you can to become better. Yeah. So those are boaters. What about the actual like physical boats? Are, are you seeing brand new boats like zero hours breaking them in or are these yes. used boats? Yeah. Yeah. A, a lot of new boats, well, probably that 70% rule, right? So okay. a lot of brand new boats from dealers around here, uh, Miami, Fort Myers, you name it. Um, and then, yeah, there's been uh, a few used boats. Absolutely. But a lot of them have been brand new. Got it. Yeah. What's interesting is uh, my buddy Zane, you know, worked for Mastercraft for many years and, and he was telling me, cause we were having the same conversation about all the new boaters. And he said with Mastercraft, you know, they don't sell as many because these are those big, expensive, you know, six figure wake boats that you right. see in these lakes. And with everyone sold, they send out a person just like you, uh, sometimes for a half day, sometimes a whole day. It, right. It's it's built into the price. And I don't remember what, right. oh, it's called a boat caddy is the name, the boat caddy. And the yep. caddy goes out there and shows you everything from backing it up to, to right. storage, to literally every accessory on there. And I thought that was so brilliant. It would probably, yeah, uh, man, it would probably save a, a lot of time and energy and headaches and broken things on a boat. Uh, if all companies right. did that, I thought that was so smart. Yeah. Every, every dealer is different. Um, unfortunately, in most cases that I've seen is they do offer a orientation during the delivery of the boat. But generally, it's not that long. Normally, it's about an hour, maybe two hours. They just go out and show them how to run around and say adios, crack the champagne. That's about it. Hi uh, <laughs> literally, I've, I have showed up on site at dealerships multiple times where the customer gets back from their one to two hour orientation. It's no fault to the dealers. You know, they don't have all that time. Uh, you know, they're cranking boats out the, out the lot every day. But, um, and I show up and then we go do a class and we deliver the boat down to their home or something. And they're just blown away. They're like, wow, we didn't go through that much. <laughs> but uh, we get, we get pretty in depth with our classes for sure. We, we get pretty advanced eventually. Cool. All right. Well, let's flip over to after purchase, this yeah. guy or gal now owns a boat. Right. What are the mistakes? Like what are the, the, we'll start maybe the obvious ones you're seeing over and over again to some that, that people might not you know be aware of. Yeah, number one, let's just talk about navigation. Um, the west coast of Florida, there's a lot of shallows, right? It's not like the east coast where you got the intercoastal, you got the beach, and you got an inlet. That's about it. Over here, we got a lot of back channels. We got a lot of shallow water just off the beach. Um, and people are not, or customers I see are not understanding and putting two and two together, reds and greens, and what they mean. Which side should you be on? Um, you know, on the intercoastal, the reds are always on the dirt side of the ditch and the greens are always on the Gulf side. I'd say about 95% of people don't even know that right there. Um, so, you know, and what does that lead to? That leads to you running aground. Eventually it will happen. So navigation is number one. And 
and are you including obviously tides and people being stuck on sandbars and all that in there too? Yeah. Or is that okay? Yeah. If you hit, if you hit shallow water at a high tide, guess what's going to happen when the water starts dropping, <laughs> you're going to be there a while and it's going to be a thousand dollar tow bill, you know? So, and you know, things of, of the right of way, you know, who has the right of way in certain situations. Um, obviously the person on your starboard coming across, you, you know, you have to give way to that individual. So that's, that's the main stuff with navigating is just thinking through, looking at your chart, making sure you're on the, the right side of that red or green. And you can learn most of that in like just the general voter safety course, right? I mean, you can, but sometimes you have to see it, right? Because what happens is the Coast Guard actually doesn't make it easy on you. When you're riding out there in the bay, sometimes they'll only give you the greens or sometimes they'll only give you the reds. And so you got to know whether you're going to a larger body or a smaller body of water to conclude whether or not that red or green needs to be on your left or right. So it gets very challenging. So what's the answer? <laughs> so if you're coming from a larger body of water to a smaller body of water, red should be on your right. A lot of people think it's coming back into port or coming back into home base. And sometimes that's accurate. Sometimes it's not. You know, here around Tampa Bay, we got a lot of large and small bodies of water. We got Tampa Bay, Gulf of Mexico, Boca Ciega, the intercoastal. Uh, so it constantly flip-flops. Um, and then I like to say green, right, go. You know, green's on your right. You're going out to a bigger body. That's good. So really, 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 uh, you have to know where you're at. And looking at your electronics is huge and knowing where you're at. You got to know when you're in the intercoastal and when you're not, you know, those types of things. Cool. So what's, yeah. what's next after navigation? Oh, man. Uh, well, we talked about trailering a little bit, right? Communication. I, I can't stress communication enough. I have, uh, I have guys, customers, but usually the husband all the time, they, they'll, they'll call me and they'll say, man, I just, I want to go through this. I'm just going to sit on the boat and listen. I just want you to go through everything with my wife. That way we're both on the same page. And then I want you to go do a class with just my wife. And it's really cool. And eventually they do start working as a team because they heard me say it. And that goes with anchoring, trailering, you, you name it, docking. It's just, it's, it's about being prepared. Yeah. I feel like trailer is probably the biggest point of anxiety um, yeah. because there's other people there watching right. two expensive items, right? Usually people's like two most valuable you know, possessions of their truck and their boat. And there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And you, and, you only want one to go in the water. Yeah. The yeah, water. Yeah. <laughs> like it's yeah. so bad where literally one time, this is like five years ago, it was, uh, we were scalloping and, and leaving. There was a one ramp lane and it was like an hour wait. It was, it was a beautiful weekend. Everybody was out scalloping and there's a huge line. And the guy in front of me was, was on deck. He was up to go next. And, uh, and he literally comes up to my, to my car. I like, told asked me to walk, roll the window down. So he's like, Hey, uh, would you mind, would you mind backing my, my car in and I, that way I can get the boat and we can do it faster and so sure whatever he had no idea who I was he went up to a total stranger and asked them to go into his jeep like a brand new jeep wrangler <laughs> back his boat in so I get in there and his wife is in the passenger seat and she was just like he, he played it off like it was all for speed and convenience and I was like I saw his wife in there I was like what's going on and she was like thank you so much for doing this he's been sweating bullets for the last 45 minutes um thank you so much for doing this like totally ratted him on it and he was yeah. so scared to back the truck in himself that he brought, he asked a total stranger to go hop in his car with his wife next to him and yeah. do it. Like that's a lot of anxiety to, to do that. Yeah. I've got a similar story with, uh, you know, Bunce's Pass is our, you know, popular sandbar around here and Bunce's Pass goes east to west. And it's very narrow. It's an unmarked pass. And there's a lot of tide, you know, sometimes that tide can be two, three, four knots in there you know, running east and west, incoming or outgoing. And before I even was, have been coaching people, this is years ago, I've, I have swam out personally twice to some random guy on his boat and be like, hey, do you just want me to do this for you really quick? And it's hilarious. They just give up the helm. They're like, come on, dude. <laughs> I don't want any liability. But uh, yeah, it's, it's nuts. It's and funny it, though. And it doesn't have to be that way too, right? That's no, it a, doesn't. A lot of anxiety and just with a little bit of guidance, that anxiety can totally, it won't yeah. totally go away, but but a lot of it's just, just taking it slow and just knowing the, the, the mechanics, the proper. Right. Yeah, so what yeah. are your tips there? Well, because I know your, your family, right? Trailers like those massive 80 foot house right? Mm -hmm. you, 
Remember yep, that? my dad did that for 30 years. He transported uh, large houseboats and yachts and taking them apart, putting them back together for a long time, truck and trailer. And uh, yeah, it's, I guess that's part of where I learned a lot of this stuff too. My dad, he's, he's been in the boat business his, his entire life, really. So you, you might take some of it for granted just because it's, it's been part of your life forever. What, what are your recommendations for the new boater backing in? Maybe it's their first boat ever. Maybe it's a monster boat, like, you know, a 32 or, or larger boat. Yeah. What, what do you, what do you tell them to practice calm? at home? Just yeah. practice getting it into the driveway, doing things like that. Uh, a big part of my classes, I always tell people aim small, miss small. So, you know, I get a lot of feedback from people will, you know, I'm here, I'm at the dock, like as far as docking the boat, but, but it wasn't perfect, right? We're, we're aiming for perfection here, aim small, miss small. So yeah, you are at the dock, but let's try to get it as good as you can. I think it's the same thing with trailering, um, aim small, miss small, just do it the best you can at home a thousand times, take it to gas stations, you know, go, go different places and, and see different situations. And it'll make you, it'll make you hit that ramp the first time. Nobody likes the boat ramp champ. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and go to like a like a Walmart parking lot or something at night, and 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 just make yourself good into a parking yeah. spot. And uh, right. the worst thing you could do is go to a boat ramp on a weekend and try it there. Like that is <laughs> that is a guaranteed way for something to go wrong, and yeah. potentially make an unqualified captain. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's the thing about the qualified captain, and what a cool Instagram and Facebook and stuff. You know, it's obviously geared to kind of making fun of people in a way, but at the same time, it's like, what are you going to do about it? right? Because I'm, I'm a passionate boater. Our, our boat is down here. It's been in my family since it's 36 feet, since I was seven. And I don't want to be the victim. I don't want to be on the receiving end of one of those guys, you know? So, you know, our, our motto here is creating better boaters one at a time. So let's try to fix them all. <laughs> Love it. So, so what else, what are some other mistakes? Uh, I, I think what I want to go into for sure is the accessories, whether we're talking power poles, troll motors, all of your, your electronics, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and obviously you could go really big on right. some of these, you know, half a million dollar boats. Are, are you seeing people going way too big and just buying everything or not enough? Where, where, where are you seeing the bigger problem? Yeah. These newer boats, they're coming pretty decked out with electronics, you know, 12 inch screens, 16 inch screens. Um, obviously you have more of the base models where you get some smaller screens. Um, but, uh, it really just depends on what you want to do. You know, there's a lot of crossover boats these days, right? So like y'all's Pathfinder, that's a straight fishing boat. You know, you're going to go fish that thing and that's what it's going to do. You got a tower, but there's a lot of these, you know, 24, 22 to 28, 29 foot center consoles now where you're taking the family out. You got cushions and upholstery everywhere. Uh, you've got a big trolling motor up on the bow now. That's the thing to do uh, for, you know, offshore. Um, so you just have to, once again, work with somebody who knows how to rig your boat right for, for you and what you're going to do with the boat. Um, you know, power poles are cool. One mistake as far as power poles go, I've had a couple clients strictly buy a power pole to anchor at the sandbar. And I said, you know, that's cool, but um, the, it's, it's, a, it's only a temporary tool. So let's say you throw your front anchor out, you're backing up to the sandbar and you want to stick that thing real fast to kind of hold you there for a second, that's fine. But what happens is as the tide and stuff goes out during the day, as the boat waves come, that pole picks up and it picks up and it picks up. And then eventually you start moving. So never do that with a power pole. Don't buy it just for anchoring at the sandbar. Get, uh, get you a stern anchor, right? With 50 feet of line, that's what I teach. And, and sink that thing in the sand. It's a lot, a lot cheaper than a power pole too. It is, absolutely. Power poles for fishing. <laughs> It'll save a lot of money. I've seen it many times where they go to a bar and the, you know, the sandbar and then the tide comes up and that power pole is attached to the boat. Right. So when the water raises up, it'll pull that power yeah. pole right out and then see you later boat. It's, yeah. uh, well, especially when you're in an area with a lot of tide, you know, you're putting a lot of strain on that expensive piece of equipment, right? It's not, it's not used for that. Yep. Cool. Um, do you, do you have any recommendations on electronics? Have you seen any um, particular brands or types that you think are just better in general uh, for yeah. new boaters? Like just, you know, kind of like an entry level, assuming we're not talking about someone that, because if you got a 700,000 or boat, you can probably, you'd probably don't care. But just yeah. in general, you know, the, you know, 20 to 24, 25 foot center console, 
What, what are right. you seeing just based on what's been breaking, what's ease of use, where are people getting frustrated? Yeah, um, I'm more of a Simrad and Garmin guy. Um, I don't really, I'm not really particular about the Ray Marine stuff. Um, I think Garmin why, and why is that? Just the, uh, the functionality of it. I, I don't like some of the features that they have and how you can overlay data and, and how difficult it is to use. Hmm. They're pretty cool, but it, they just seem difficult to use. Um, Garmin, I think, is a good device for the person who's just who's just navigating, right? They're just a boater. Um, I think they have great mapping, uh, great autopilot features, very easy to use. Um, the displays are very easy to understand. Uh, but as far as the fishing side goes, I'm 100% a Simrad guy. I've got Simrad on my boat, had Simrad on my old boat. And the functionality of Simrad when you're out offshore bottom fishing um, and, and they're really easy to use too. Yeah. And you're so not sponsored by Simrad. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make sure. And the cool, thing about, all. the cool thing about a lot of them these days is that like, we have a, we have a Garmin in ours and, and just explore new areas. Like we were down to the keys. When you get on the GPS mode, it actually has, it looks like a runway. So it has the channel marked. So yep. even going around the keys when, you know, obviously when there's a red and a green, it's very easy when they're close to each other. Like even if right. you have no idea what red and green means, right. but in many cases, there's only one sitting there and okay, what side do I go on? And, and the guard, at least the one we have, it, it basically has like a runway and you just stay in the runway. And, yeah. And it's, it, I think it's the 3D mode. Yep. And uh, Simrad and Garmin have that 3D mode. When, and I like that a lot, especially if you're traveling in one direction for a long time. Um, I've never used it in an application like that, just kind of navigating tight channels and stuff. That's pretty cool. Yeah, um, they'll keep you out of trouble. Just like an yeah. owner who just does, doesn't want to think and just kind of right. uh, obviously you uh, still need to learn the channel markers. But but when in yeah. doubt, like when you're in one of those kind of situations where, OK, what body of water is bigger, um, then you could rely on that. Yeah. Um, that chart yeah i'd say i'd say most of these newer boats are getting rigged with garmins um so i've 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 come to like them more than i used to and they are really functional um they do have a new feature that they're working on they're still working the bugs out of it it's the uh auto guidance feature right so traditionally you put a waypoint in and it just draws you a line right that could be over land over shallow water but this new auto guidance feature it will create a route for you through the proper channels. So all you have to do is find the pink line and you're in safe water. But I have found that it doesn't work all the time. So make sure to double check the auto guidance feature if you have Garmin. <laughs> yeah, and, and going out of a pass, like on the Gulf on the Gulf of Florida, a lot of those passes, the, the channels right. will move when the bars move. Yep. And yep. that would be a risky, a risky That's, play. Yeah, a lot of people think, you know, we're offshore now. We don't have to worry. That's that's not true. That sand shifts. Um, you know, off St. Pete, that sand can go out to a mile in some shallow water. So you got to watch it. You got to watch it. It is cool, though. In, in general, I'm, I'm betting it works just the same way. It does. That, you know, Surrey or whoever your your phone uh, voice activated thing is when you say, right. hey, give me give me directions here. Right. And uh, that's really, really cool. Um, yeah, the it, it works really well for short distances when it doesn't have to plot out because that's what it does. It plots out waypoints, right? And then it just draws a line between the waypoints. So if you have more waypoints, longer distance, then it starts to shortcut those things and it'll take you over land and stuff like that. So but I think, uh, you know, give it another year or two and it'll be really good. Cool. All right. Well, back to the power poles and anchors, you know, we just, uh, just published last week, our final anchor, really it's an anchor course, where Captain Peter Deeks, he yep. went out with really about the top, was the top seven types of anchors and took it over, you know, quite a few different terrains, bottom terrains, cool. and in and, and a couple different, you know, situations, uh, you know, rope uh, versus chain versus a really long scope and kind of changed all up and, and was kind of ranking them from like a one to three, a three yep. meant it did exactly like it's supposed to. It held for the most part it, within seconds. A two was like it, it held, but it took a while, it drug for a while. Number one, one point was like, it sucked. It like, it, it just, it wouldn't even hold. Mm -hmm. And overall uh, the big Bruce anchor and, and then the, uh, you know, any type of claw was right behind it, but that big Bruce anchor yeah. was, was number one overall for every type of situation. Right. Um, but yet I I'm willing to bet almost, all new boats come with a fluke or some type yep. of, they're not coming with a big Bruce anchor. Are you seeing that as well? And 
the boats and what are your issues on the anchoring side of things? I'd say 90% of these boats are coming with that Delta plow anchor. Oh, they are. Okay, cool. That's that stainless Delta. So the bigger um, boat. I'm, I'm, yeah. Well, even the small ones too, that have a windlass, you know, they're putting windlasses on these 25 foot runabouts. Now hmm. they're putting these, uh, the Delta plows in on them, which is fine. They work pretty good. I'm not a huge fan of them. I'm, I'm more about that plow anchor the, or the claw kind of, um, or the Danforth style. I'm just a, I'm simple. That Danforth style uh, works well for me. It always has, but it depends on the terrain that you're in. Right. Um, and most of the time, I'd say 90% of the time, it's not really about the anchor. It's making sure that you have enough chain, making sure that you're using enough scope to get that anchor to set properly, assuming your anchor is the right anchor for the bottom conditions you're in. Right. But I know with a lot of, uh, you know, fishing guides like Deeks over there and whatnot, they don't want a lot of chain because it's, it's, it's a pain to deal with. Uh, you get that chain wrapped around some structure and whatnot. Um, you're not getting that thing back. Right. Uh, so yeah, less chain, you know, then that anchor, right. This type of anchor would probably come way more into play for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put, we'll put links to that in entire course. You can see just cause they, they took an underwater camera, had a videographer go down and in every single circumstance yep. and film. So it's really neat to see exactly what's happening down there. And we, as Luke mentioned, we were just in the keys and we right. had a couple of times where our anchor was not holding as well and uh as well as it should and because the yeah. current's ripping by some of these bridges yeah. and i'm i'm right down there watching it it's it's really fascinating to see uh yeah. why it's not sticking and then what it takes to stick uh right. pretty uh, it's pretty cool yeah yeah that would be i mean that is a cool test assuming that you know you you kept the amount of scope the same and the amount of road out the same right because traditionally i you know just let some more line out you know the, the more horizontal the more scope you have on that line the better that anchor is going to set in any situation Yep. Um, let's go to docking. Cause that's another one that I I've, I've watched some of your videos. It's, it's pretty cool. So, Thanks. you know, Will gets on there, you know, with new boat owners, as we talked about, and occasionally with obviously their permission, he'll, he'll film it. And, uh, and I saw the one where it was, a, it was a pretty large boat. Um, yeah. and, uh, that was like a, last week and you were helping them dock it in some kind of tight, tight spots. Uh, talk about that and the mistakes people are making, or if it's just going too fast or breathing too hard. Uh, <laughs> the guy did great. I mean, he, he had a couple little errors I saw, but for the most right. part, he figured it right. out and he corrected it. So what do you, what, what are your tips there and what yeah. mistakes are happening? Well, before we even talk about docking, just the handling side, you have to know how to handle your boat in tight quarters. Um, and the biggest mistake people make with the handling side is what I call they're not stern focused. They're driving their car on the water, right? They're focusing on that bow so much that they're not looking backwards. They're not looking at that engine. A boat rotates on a third of its axis, which is up there in the bow. And the two thirds of the boat from that axis point back is what's rotating around. So just because you turn and your bow clears something doesn't mean your stern clears something. So understanding your movements with the steering wheel and how to manipulate that stern port and starboard is how you successfully come to the dock, right? Um, and yeah, as far as you know, moving into docking, uh, especially with a lot of people with outboards, uh, even stern drives, if you choose to drive it in that way, people don't turn the wheel before they shift, right? So let's say you're backing off your trailer, right? You want the stern to go port. So you're going to turn that wheel all the way to the left and you're going to pop it in reverse and that stern comes off the trailer and it walks and it walks forward. But they want to go forward and they want to go to the right. Well, they shift and forward before they turn their wheel and then the boat starts doing things that they don't want it to do, right? So with an outboard boat, when you're steering and your propulsion are all in one, you have to turn the wheel before you shift. That's, that's, Everybody makes that mistake. Even experienced boaters make that mistake. It's almost like they're afraid to, to be in neutral. Um, that's, yes. that's a big mistake I see. But neutral is your friend. Right. Um, and a lot of people are so quick to go from, from reverse to forward or vice versa right. that they need to actually keep it neutral. That'll give you time yep. to turn the wheel and to make sure that the tides, the currents, are, or right. the tides of the wind are doing what you think they're going to do. And right. um, almost like more the more time in neutral, the better the results are in yep. the the That's first good. hour of the yeah. class, before we even get near a dock, we're, we're making sure that they are comfortable with their shifter, with their control. You have to. 
because if you're at the dock and you accidentally give a little bit of throttle and forward, that's not going to be good, right? It's happened to me a couple times. It's scary. You don't want that. Not me personally, but one of my clients that I was coaching and I had to go over there and snatch the throttle back for him. You yeah. know what I mean? So you have to get really comfortable with that. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like don't go any faster than, than the speed that you want to hit the dock. <laughs> yep. and, and I hear that all the time. And that's a perfectly way to think about it. It's correct. You're not going to mess up. But when there's tide and there's wind involved, sometimes you need that momentum. And when you have, when you bring the boat to the dock with that momentum, you better know how to stop the boat and you better know how to bring that stern over. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's, it's all situational based. Um, I, lo I love the neutral thing. Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm a member still of freedom boat club. Uh, Luke and I have, you know, have the Pathfinder there in St. Pete, but for the lakes, I, I love going out on the weekends and not having to own a second boat. And um, I right. talked to those guys there. You used to work at Freedom for a while, so you know. And I, I was like, man, what's the number one thing that you see when people are coming in here and just, just basically they'll have it a beautiful day, you know, because they're out there just throwing the anchor down and going up to a little sandbar on the lakes. And they all of a sudden get to the dock and that's when a lot of the, the damage gets done. They're right. nailing these docks right yeah. in front of the people. Like people are jumping out of the way and it's like, they're yeah. afraid to put it neutral. They're like, yeah. and, and they go they way too fast. Yeah. But so one of my, one of my bad, uh, I call it mean, I guess. If, if I have a client who does not know how to stop their boat, we go find somewhere relatively safe and I get them going about 2,000 RPM straight for a mangrove bush. It sounds <laughs> reckless. We're going straight for the bushes. And I said, look, you're either going to learn how to stop this boat or we're going for a ride in the bushes. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they know how to stop their boat. You know what I mean? Um, you know, and I, I try to stress to them, that bush could be a swimmer. It could be another boat. You have to learn how to do that. You got to learn how to go to neutral. You got to learn how to stop your momentum. Like have you, have you rules out there, man. yeah have you have you made it into in any mangrove trees yet <laughs> not yet we got close one time but they, they they pulled it off uh, yeah. a lot of new boaters they they think that if they if they floor it in reverse it's going to have the same effect as if they floor it in neutral or, or forward i'm sorry so if you floor it in forward yeah you're going to go somewhere but in reverse you're not really going to go anywhere because that thrust is pushing up against the boat and it's not going to be as dramatic right so if you have to uh, full send in reverse, it's okay. You can do that. <laughs> well, that's, that's another reason why I think a lot of people just ran docks is because that forward, the forward gear, if just in neutral, right, or even a little bit more than neutral, it'll propel much faster than the same, the same right. distance from neutral and reverse. Right. Uh, so that's, that and, has so many people just ran in docks. Yeah. Yeah. One of the first things we do is we, we get people in tight scenarios and canals and people hate it, man. They sweat it where you can't, you can't make a U-turn. I've got a couple marinas in St. Pete and some of the other captains we use down in Miami and, and, and West coast where we, we take them in there and we say, okay, spin this boat around using the handling maneuvers based on the stern that we just went over out in open water. And man, they sweat hands shaking on the shifter steering wheel you know, because they're not thinking it through step by step. And you just have to trust that they're going to do it, walk them through it, and they, and they eventually do it. Once they get past that, then they're a whole lot less afraid of the dock. So what's the mistake that they're making in the canals? Well, it's in the canals, it's all about spacing and remembering which way you're going to turn the wheel in reverse or forward, right? So, you know, like a, a big diesel twin engine boat, you're not using the steering wheel at all. Um, you're just shifting with just the shifters left and right, port starboard. That's it. But if you're an outboard boat, then you got the wheel involved. Or if you have a twin outboard boat, you have the, you can either choose to steer it with the wheel or just use the shifters. It's all based on your comfort level. We teach both ways, but um, it's, you, it's remembering the motions, right? Remembering where that stern's going to go. When you decide to do that, you turn that wheel a certain way. That's good. All right. What else? What other um, mistakes, things that you're seeing that people are struggling with? Oh, man. Uh, you know, rules of the road, etiquette. Let's see, we've covered navigation a little bit, docking, handling, anchoring at the sandbar. Um, just back to anchoring at the sandbar. You know, when you're in an area with a lot of tide, uh, the first and most critical piece in doing that is putting the anchor into the direction of the tide or wind. 
whatever is strongest. All right, say that again, putting the anchor into the tide or wind, whichever Correct. is strongest. So you're going to bring the momentum of that boat forward into the tide or wind, whichever one's strongest. So what, what we do is we stop, we stop the boat and we figure out which one's strongest. Is it the wind or is it the tide? What's going to push us around? Then we take the boat in that direction and then we drop our anchor. You bring the bow of the boat where you want your anchor to go, your front anchor. And then immediately you turn the wheel in the proper direction, put it in reverse, and we got to get to the beach fast as we can. Um, Because when you're sideways, right, now you're backing into a beach potentially sideways with that wind or current. And that is when people get in trouble. It's that transition. The more time you spend sideways with that tide or current, the more time you're pushing down the beach, potentially getting into somebody else's boat. So you got to do it fast and you have to bring the boat and set that anchor in the proper direction. What, what are you telling, especially your new boaters, when you pull up to a sandbar, it's a Saturday or a Sunday on Labor Day weekend here. What are you telling them? The, the, just imagine the, the, the there's, oh, there's spots open, but it's pretty yep. packed. Where are you telling them to go? How are you telling them to navigate? Because we, we've all been there where we've seen some people just like, and, and they're struggling. And sometimes they get embarrassed and just leave and go like to a whole different side of the sandbar. What, what yeah. do you, how do you coach them? Cause I know that's also, uh, you know, one of those that can be a, a, a nail biter for one everyone, my, for everyone involved. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of my main rules is no when to ditch. So if you're in the situation, some great sayings anchor, here. Yeah. No when to ditch <laughs> when, when you're, when you're at the sandbar anchoring or when you're at the dock and you know, deep down in your heart that you just screwed up, that's the point in time where you need to get out of there. You need to start over and you need to try again, or just avoid the situation when you're, when you're at the sandbar like that and let, you know, you got your buddy there, right? You got your buddy with his friends both there and you have to get next to him. You know, that's, what's going to make the day. Right. If you if you can't do that or you don't have that situation, just go find somewhere that's easier. Go to the other side of the beach. I don't know. Just it's all, it's about making it stress free. Don't try to do something you're not comfortable with. If you're not comfortable with it and you want some more help, you want some more training, find somebody that can help you with that. Yeah, it's like trailering. Right. It's similar to like just going before you get into the weekend at the busy boat ramp. Go, you know, go to a big parking lot first. Yeah. And with anchoring go on like a friday or something or yeah. go just away from all the chaos but traffic practice perfection like what will was saying earlier practice so that you're trying to get at the exact right spot and you're mad if you don't um and then when you actually do it right when you get used to doing it without all the commotion around then you have a fighting chance to do it when the when the stress is involved there's yeah. a whole lot more stress when there's boats on both sides and you're, and you're trying to deal with the wind and the current if you haven't mastered it, if you can't nail it without the boats and stuff around, better not yep. try it. That's not the yep. place to practice. Yeah. Good captains are prepared, bottom line. When you're coming to the dock, like take it from somebody who, when you start moving up the, up the ladder and you start getting on 50, 60, 70, 80 foot boats, the, pre the preparation and you on the helm is everything. You're only as good as your first mate, right? So getting your fenders ready, getting your dock lines ready understanding where the time and when's going to take you when that happens. You know, there's times all the time where I tell my first mate or I tell the person on the boat, I need you to get this line on right now or else this wind is going to push us off the dock and I need it as fast as possible. You say it in a nice way, but you know, that could be your wife, your buddy, anything. You have to do that or it's just going to turn into a situation that you don't like and that's going to make you stressful, right? I would, I would also say if you have a, first mate who's maybe a little bit newer to boating or you're newer yep. make sure you know how to tie knots and make sure right. you know how to actually tie a rope around a boat cleat or a dock cleat yep. uh yeah, we, I did that we with, totally skipped that part <laughs> oh it's it's, it's and it happened with my wife uh a while back and she's just not she's just used to never having to do that and you know currents ripping and all of a sudden like it caused a massive fight and I'm like, what do you mean you don't know how to tie a rope around a cleat? Yeah. It's so simple, but it's it's not uh, for for everybody. Yeah. Um, well, so go for it. That's that's something amazing too. Is that people that have been boating five to ten years, they don't know correct how to correctly do a marlin spike on a cleat, or or tie it up correctly, or tie a knot on a fender. So you know, I have different ways of doing that. If it's a if it's a new boater, we just go straight into doing it before we leave the dock. Make sure we how to do this. 
But if it's a boater that, you know, they say they are experienced and they've been there 10 years, then we kind of throw it in at times just to make sure they know how to do it, you know. But yeah, that's a that's a huge deal. Um, you got to know how to do that and do it fast. One of my biggest pet peeves is watching somebody when I'm at the helm take about five minutes to undo the cleat. Oh, it drives me nuts. I'm like, hurry up. My grandma can do this. <laughs> I'm going to ram you into a mangrove tree, you punk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, man, it's, it's all about preparation, um, making sure you're set up and ready to go. When you're anchoring, think the process through, understand what you should be doing, um, you know, get the boat ready. And, and just practice too. And that's why it's, it, the worst thing, whether it's trailering, docking, go, you know, anchoring at the sandbar, the worst thing you could possibly do is just try to learn it as you go. Uh, that's yeah. when all the chaos happens and it makes it even worse when there's a lot of people around because no matter how much you think you can uh you can power through the the peer pressure ish you know it, it's, it's hard to think that even if nobody's watching it, it, in your mind it's just more um just more stressful and that leads to bad decisions so yeah. and and boating is not supposed to be stressful fishing can be stressful sometimes right you got some pressure on you you're throwing the cast net 100 times in the morning or something like that but you know, your, your general boater, it's not supposed to be stressful. So if it's stressful, you need to do something about that and change that. Right. right. It's about just making it easier on yourself. It, it, yeah, that, even, that's really it, all what it is. Yeah. I'd say even at the ramp too, is like literally on a, on a slow day, just go like on a like late Sunday where like after all the, the chaos has happened and just do it like four times right then back to back to back to back. Like, obviously you don't have to do it that many times, right. uh, but just do it. Right. And, and you'll get better yeah. at reversing and just everything flows better. And then when the crowds are there, it's, it's a million times easier. Yeah. So on on yeah, a Tuesday, uh, like I live right near a ramp, go by the Tuesdays. They're completely dead. Right. Uh, take a, take a, a couple hours off, take a longer lunch break and just go do it on a, on a Tuesday at a local ramp. Yep. Yep. On a weekday. Um, Generally, when we do that with classes, we do it about five different times. So we, you know, usually, uh, usually the person knows how to back the trailer up by then, right? Uh, but it's, it's more about getting the spouse to put that boat on the trailer successfully um, and getting over that fear, right? Um, so and, loading, and loading on is more, more so than backing up. Interesting. Yep, absolutely. That's where everybody's scared the most is getting the boat back on the trailer. Interesting. Yeah, and that's where the frustration comes in because then that that person or that spouse doesn't feel comfortable doing it. So then you have to put the boat on the dock. You have to tie the boat up. You have to walk up and get the truck. You have to back the truck down the ramp. Then you have to walk back to the boat, put it on. Then you have to get off the boat somehow. So, you know, you can cut out about 10 minutes of time by just teaching the person, the other person, the spouse, how to put that boat on the trailer right. No. And you got people yelling at you at the ramp. What the heck? Yeah, one biggest mistake, another big mistake that uh, people make trailering is when they're loading that boat back on the trailer, they back the trailer in too far. So when you back the trailer in too far, the boat comes up on the trailer and it's floating above the trailer all the way up to the, the bow stop there, right? When what you should do is you should leave a little bit of your bunks, those most forward bunks exposed out of the water. So when you bring that boat up on the trailer, if you give it a little RPM and trim the engine up just a touch, it will slide itself up on the trailer up to the bow stop. And then you're stuck, right? That My dad and I, they, they used to call that sticking the boat, sticking the boat on the trailer. You got to stick the boat, right? And once you do that, then you can let off the throttle and the boat's not going to get anywhere. It, the bunks kind of, the bunks and the trailer guys kind of do the work for you and, and, and you know, glide it up on there. Yeah, and every and every trailer has its spot. You know, I have this this I've had this gift forever, and so I just look in the rear views as soon as as soon as that one little that one little uh, offshoot on the uh, on the trailer goes underwater, that's my point. And uh, right. and so it's what that's what all Absolutely. about repetition. You, you'll have you'll have your spot, right? Whatever trailer and, and whatever trailer, every boat's different on draft. And yep. everything. When so, you're looking out your mirror, you know exactly where to put it. Yeah. And once you get it, you have it. And so that way, that's the game. Just small little details are, are the reason why the, the practice on the, the non-chaotic days is just yep. so valuable because, because now you have time to pay attention to those sort of details when yep. there's crowds around and like people are yelling at each other, they're trying to hurry up. Like you're just trying to get out of there and you're freaking out. Like you totally overlook all of the important details. So right. uh, yeah, just such a, a big emphasis on practice. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's all about just 
just getting it lined up straight, talking about the tide, talking about the wind, being on the same person with the person in the truck, you know, put your phone on, right? Get on speakerphone. One person in the truck, one person on the boat. You, you'll know exactly what's going on. That's good. Yeah. Versus the screaming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yelling, can't hear you. Yelling at each other through the window. <laughs> Your truck's too loud. Yeah, especially um, with a two-stroke. Yeah, you can't hear the person in the car. That's a good yeah. idea. It is to yeah. get on. That's smart. Yeah. But for well, anybody considering getting, you know proper professional training on your boat it's it's kind of a funny thing to say right but um it's it's been so rewarding to watch people literally start from ground zero and work their way up i mean they're they're just such nice people they're so appreciative their confidence level is sky high their spouses confidence levels are sky high it just makes everything go way smoother Yep. And that's why we got the captain's coach. So what, what's, uh, right. what's like your website and stuff? Where can people go learn, learn more and see some of your videos, et cetera? Yeah. So on Facebook, it's called the captain's coach. We're on Instagram as well. Uh, captainscoaching.com is the website. And then uh, if you have any questions, it uh, doesn't matter where you are in the state of Florida, we can find you a good captain to link up with. That's good at training. Um, Captain Will at captainscoaching.com. You can shoot me an email there and let me know your situation. Cool, man. Any, uh, any other final words, any other final uh, random little mistakes that you see that can be avoided? Oh, uh, there's a million of them, right? <laughs> <laughs> we could talk here all day about it. <laughs> but uh, no, just, just have fun. Have fun. Be, uh, be prepared. Uh, have fun. Be, be on the same page as your spouse and just try to think through things and get the right help. Get the right help. Don't just keep struggling, you know? Good. Yeah, this stuff isn't intuitive. It's not, it's not something you can just learn, it's learn not. as you go. It, has, it needs to be taught. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and it's coming. It's definitely coming because insurance companies are now mostly driving that business forward, right? The training side. Uh, you know, I have a few clients that have bought north, boats north of a half million dollars and they required them to get training by a captain and the captain sign off on them. Hmm. Uh, so they're pushing it right now. Um, I think there's some things in the pipeline that uh, the state's going to require it to eventually, um, you know, not just the Florida Boater Safety Course. So it's it's, uh, it's coming for sure. It's good. I mean, it, it, it for even really experienced boaters, they all want that. Not, not for themselves yeah. per se, but so you don't have as many knuckleheads out there you know, causing damage with either their wakes or running into you or just causing mayhem yes. out there. Uh, and, and just, you know, when you have people that don't know the rules and are out there nervous, and if you combine alcohol, I mean, that, that I mean, we, we see it all the time on not just qualified captain, but you read about it in the paper sometimes right. or, or the, right. you know, the news, wherever you happen to read right. stuff. Don't. And it's, oh man, it's scary. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a huge one right there. Just don't drink. Just don't drink when you're behind yeah. the helm. I mean, you know, I've heard, I've had so many bad stories, not me personally, my friends that, um, and, and people that I've worked with, you know, people getting killed, uh, you know, just total accidents, but alcohol was involved. It changed their life forever. Um, yep. You know, so just don't do that. Uh, a good tip. If you do enjoy drinking beer like me and you are the captain for the day, um, I, I found I, I did not like not drinking. I'll be honest. I, I was just, I, you know, my friends are drinking. So this whole summer, we, you know, we spent a lot of time out in the boat and um, I got the Bush light in a, if and some of you <laughs> see me drink that you're like, Oh man, you got to pound them in Bush lights. And I, I, you know, take a six pack of, but not in a means non-alcoholic. So there's no alcohol. You still kind of, you know, feel like you're drinking beer. You feel a whole lot better than your friends. And, uh, and when you get back to the dock or marina or wherever, uh, where you're not driving anything, uh, obviously you can have a real drink, but, uh, yeah. uh, I, I, it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, uh, yeah. and I, I'm a big fan now of, uh, they taste just like a real bush light, uh, <laughs> minus the, uh, the, uh, a slight buzz. Yeah. Um, that'll, so just, that'll take a minute to explain to FWC. <laughs> it's right here. NA. I swear, just read it. <laughs> No, but it, that is legal. You are legally yeah, allowed no, to have, uh, you know, Bush Light NA. There's no alcohol in it, right. but it still has that beer taste, and uh, you still feel like you're uh, you're drinking with your friends. Um, you yeah, yeah. Still got to be cool, all right? Got to be cool on the way. Got to be looking good. Got to be got to be yeah. cool. And and it's a whole lot cooler than White Claw. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, for sure. 
Yeah, can't do it, man. I don't know what's going on with Wyatt over there, but <laughs> uh, yeah, we've had a long talk with him. So, <laughs> I right, will super helpful, Captain's Coach. Uh, if you guys have any questions, head over to his site or Facebook page. And obviously, with all of these episodes, we put them at saltstrong.com, and uh, you can go there and leave comments down below. It'll come to all of us, and we'll make sure they're all answered and um will is one of our insider members and uh, some of you might even be hearing uh, from uh, from him uh, yeah. i'll just leave it at, uh, at that so um you guys have any questions let us know join us in the club if you haven't already and we appreciate you big time some cool things up ahead we out peace thanks again